little Hollywood EMC there for you. Yeah. So, hey, everyone. When Elijah posts that picture of the crowd later, be sure to tag yourself wherever you see yourself in the background. Hey, everybody, how's your city Comic Con going so far? Just got here. This is it, this is the start. Emerald City, go! John, is this also your first day? Well, yes, I'm having a wonderful time, except for the fact that despite these hearing aids, I can still can't get the damn questions. I would never think about them anyway. No one can, John, that's the secret. Ah, oh, good, okay. And anyway, we never give them a straight answer, do we? say what we want to say. That's right. Just nod and look evocatively into the distance. Yes, yes. All right, let's get into the questions. Question number one. Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, which you all became best friends on, hired so many amazing film techniques and technologies, so were there any moments that when you were filming you thought, this can't possibly work, but when you saw it, it really took your breath away? We're getting deep right away. The crucial moment for me was in a screening room uh, when we first we saw the first dailies of that opening sequence where young Frodo jumps onto Ian McKellen's cart. Uh, because the film can't work unless you believe all those characters are the right size. And if it doesn't work, if you don't believe that there are dwarves and hobbits of the right size, you haven't got a film. <laughs> and I was sitting in that screening room uh, when they were showing the thing, and they had a rough assembly that they had put together. And that wonderful moment where you jumped into the cart, uh, and it was absolutely a hobbit and, and, and a wizard of different sizes. And McKellen and I were, were, were both there, and we both did. <laughs> and I said to him, how the hell do you do that, Ian? And he said, I have no bloody idea. <laughs> I remember when Allie, our oldest daughter, our only child at the time that we were filming, um, you know, a year and a half or a year later, after principal photography, when the film was about to come out, and we were in this little house, and I had a laptop, and got a piece of footage, the, the teaser trailer, and showed it to her, and she just said, how does it look so real? And I said, well, you were there. Like, what's the pause? You were, when this shot, you were standing right over by the camera. She said, I know, but, and the funny thing is, it's what looked, what she was saying was real looking, was that it was matching the, her imagination, the reality of the imagination. Because if you turn the lights on and you take some stuff away, it's just, you know, a set and people and whatever. So that, that idea of what's real, what does it mean to that kind of velveteen rabbit, you know? Thing. But, you know, we, we get to see each other on the, the cast on these you know, conventions, and we will say I've been here in a long time. But being here with John, Elijah and I get to see each other all the time. We eat together, we do crossword puzzles together. All the fan fiction is true. So, but for a moment, I'm going to turn my attention away from Master Frodo and over to uh, this dwarven uh, god, John Rhys Davies. And you were talking about technology. And, the, you know, you're thinking about Andy Serkis and Gollum, and you're thinking about some of the, the visual effects. Did you ever read the Bible? Do you remember the book of Job? <laughs> this was Job. This was Job. But the first time, the first shot we ever did together was in the um, Lothlorien woods up in the trees. And they hadn't worked out John's costume right yet, so we had on this massive thing that was, you know, he, he could barely, he's a strong man, he could barely move, and they had to have a, 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 a huge air conditioner unit pointing up his skirt, you know, trying to make it so that he didn't pass out. Then they start doing the makeup on him, and the makeup is, you know, special effects makeup is being done for a hundred years. They were pushing the envelope, they almost killed this guy, and his face was peeling 
teeth yeah. like smitten with boils. Am I wrong? Am I telling the truth? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes low tech, mid tech, high tech, the the journey and the effort that goes into it and the, the kinds of, you know, sacrifices such as they are that people might not know about are real when you're doing it. So, there you go. Um, Elijah, I also want to know. Did you jump into the cart, or was that your stunt double? Oh, well, so for that wide shot of Frodo jumping into the cart, that is Kieran Shaw, not me. Yeah. And then when it's, it's me sitting next to Gandalf, that was us on a cart that was a built rig that had a seat in the front and a seat in the back, and the camera was set at a certain angle. It was essentially using classic force perspective where whatever's in the foreground and whatever's in the background, you angle the camera just right, and it looks like they're sitting right next to each other with one being taller than the other, and that's how we did the car, um, did that sequence, yeah. I would also love to follow up with a super important question of, in that scene, did you wear wigs? <laughs> have you worn wigs? <laughs> I, mean, I have. Definitely have. Will you wear wigs in the future? I certainly will. That, what's so funny about that interview that, that Dominic Monaghan did, that has really taken off again. It's amazing. It's, it continues to, to spread like wildfire and find new people who have never seen it before. Um, but I, my, my wife had never seen it, and we watched it. And I, I, I hadn't watched the interview in probably, I don't know, 20 years or something. Um, and my answer to the first question is, have you worn wigs? And I should have just been, yes. <laughs> but I was so, like, adamantly, no, I don't wear wigs. I'm like, what, man? You have to do what you have. I don't know, I think to have a word with my younger self. Um, one thing that you, about your question you asked about, like, was there something that you had seen on set from a technological standpoint or a moment that you remember uh, and how it ultimately transpired later? And the first thing that came to my mind was Andy Serkis, in his, now, green suit, not for green screen purposes, just sort of, it looked a bit like Gollum, and this is the suit that he would wear on set as Gollum, as a reference, because it was before, we weren't doing motion capture at the time, and it was really a reference pass, and then he continued to drive the animation from there, but he was there physically, and there's the scene, you'll remember it in the movie, where he's off fishing in, in, the, in the river and on the rocks, and jumping around the rocks, and grabs a fish, and he's very excited, he fucking did that, dude. <laughs> he, he, on the side of a mountain, on this, on, in this river with lots of rocks, it was very treacherous, and he is climbing on there, and it, it was so hyper-physical and so inspiring that you're like, that's, that's Gollum. And yet, you know, obviously what that ultimately became was yet to be seen. So in, in rushes, you know, going into the... It was upstairs, like in the powder horn that they had uh, uh, rushes for the, the dailies. So we would sit upstairs in this like conference room at the hotel that we were staying at, and we watched that scene. And it's just a guy in a suit <laughs> running around the rocks like a madman. You know that, but the commitment was so there and beautiful. And, and obviously, it's a memorable moment in the movie. You know, there, there, there's a, a quality in the human spirit that sometimes something won't be denied. It won't be denied. He, in, in this particular moment that Elijah's referencing, we were at the top of this mountain, and the way it sort of felt was like we had filmed the main bits, and we were going to be in cars and vans driving and trucks driving back down the mountain, but they had kind of stopped on the side of the road and found a little piece of babbling brook that maybe they could shoot something. And I don't know how long that unit that that had been there setting it up, but but Andy had been prepping for it for a month. <laughs> and, and, you know, so for us it was like, you know, a Thursday at 2.30. For him it was like the Super Bowl. And, and when they started rolling, he flopped himself down into these rocks. And, and he was, it was more than the character. He was telling us in the movie, he was telling the director, he was telling the camera people that, that, I, that this is real, this is 
this is serious, and no one is going to stop me from giving a massive performance in this movie. And, and we were all like, fuck, okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and by the way, keep in mind that what he was up against was so unique. You know, he, he, he initially was cast as a voice actor. I mean, that was part of the role. And then he'd come down and, and, and participate as a visual reference. And from that moment on, his, the driving force behind his performance was, no, it is me. And, and I am going to drive this. It's not going to be the animators at Weta who are incredible and capable, but I need to drive this physically, and everything that I'm doing is not just a reference pass. It's the real performance. And, you know, it, it resulted in, in an iconic performance. They, they, they say, you know, in your workplace, and really in life, in, in hobbies, in your family, whatever, you make yourself invaluable. You make it so that it can't, no one can imagine, you're replaceable, no one can imagine doing it without you. And it's through, with him, talent, um, and, but, but sheer force of, of grit and, and personality and physical, you know, just, gut, yeah. yeah, and by the way, a theme throughout the entirety of the shoot, you know, between, uh, um, you know, um, Aragorn getting his, his tooth knocked out and like asking for super glue so that, that you know, Vigo could put his tooth back in and keep shooting. Like, Sean's just like, like a, it's like a consistent Pierce? story. Didn't Sean's foot also get pierced? Sean's foot was pierced. Oh my god. I think, but but with John Reese, John, you had your, your face was slightly allergic to the makeup and had to endure. You know, it's. I, I, I think the point that you were making was that. Uh, those of us who are actors and have survived a little while know it is that we are the lucky ones. The class that I was in at RADA in 1968, show off. <laughs> all of them, all of them had real talent. All of them had some measure of real success. But unlike any other profession, acting depends on opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, you seize it, and you own it, and you make yourself indispensable, as you said. And, and that probably applies to other things in life as well, you know. If you get the opportunity, be prepared, and then run with it. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, well said. So we've heard about a lot of injuries, but we haven't heard any of your injuries from the set. So how did you get hurt shooting Lord of the Rings? <laughs> His feet, his feet were cut up all the time. Yeah, sure. His feet, like, yeah, sure. But his, his Elijah was like, that's a common Hobbit ailment. Yeah. <laughs> he was like Gumby. Elijah was like Gumby. Like you couldn't break him. They would tie him up and like outside of the um the pond with the watcher or whatever. The yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. They hang him upside down from a cherry picker, and sure. I'm like, you guys, it seems like maybe he's got it, but now he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like this with the arms. Yeah. But I do remember you bleeding from the feet a lot, and when they would put, when they would clean your feet off every night, they would put, use alcohol. And then, and then, uh, eucalyptus, and eucalyptus, and eucalyptus, and, uh, but he was, all the rest of us were like, ah, get it, ah, ah, that's cool. He was like, no, 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 so now that we've had some tremendous acting advice, I have a very serious question. In this era of legal cannabis, is it time for a Lord of the Rings branded weed string? Don't you think? Yes. 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 It's kind of wild. There should be, I mean, uh, um, old Toby, right? Long bottom? Long bottom leaf? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I this weed in all of East Farthing. Or is it West Farthing? I can never remember. If so there's an East, there there be lies the West. There there be lies the South. But I'm pretty sure that... The Lord of the Rings herbal community Supplements. existed before a lot of the present iterations, so they owe a debt of gratitude. <laughs> and officially licensed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weed spraying would be pretty great. There's 3,500 people in this room. 3,504 who would buy it, is all we're saying. <laughs> Very important. Hobbit, Hobbit, Hobbit mushrooms as well. Whoa! Psychedelics are all over the show. That's your booth next year, right here. Proto psychedelics. <laughs> so let's get back to the real serious acting questions. 
each of you had a different accent and dialect for the characters that you play. How did you come upon that? Did you bring that? Did an accent coach say, no, this is how you're going to be speaking? Well, you based yours on me, right? <laughs> I based my entire life and career on you. <laughs> May I introduce a future president of the United States? That used to be impressive, now they let anybody do it. <laughs> well, if you, if you want an answer, the, the truth is, Tolkien sets out roughly what his characters are like and what they sound like. Uh, we knew that the elves, for instance, have a lyricism in their voice that is based on the Welsh, the music of the Welsh language, which is very much like that and rather wonderful. But it can also be a great language of power. And let me just give you a little bit, the first word or two of the Lord's Prayer in Welsh. The Lord's Prayer, as you know, goes, Our Father, which art in heaven, right? In Welsh it is like this. I'm tired, a ruif on an airboy. And that is the language of power. And we knew that the hobbits were basically West Country. Uh, you know, uh, Somerset, maybe a bit of Dorset, maybe a bit of uh, Devon and Cornwall, a bit there. Cornwall, yeah. Yeah? They gave me a, a tape, a recording. Andrew Jack and Roshin Carty were our dialect coaches and our dialect teachers. Uh, and they gave me a recording of a farmer. Well, that's a nice shiny apple. <laughs> and I will say that before every single line. Like, do you remember the shirt, Mr. Farmer? That's a nice shiny apple. Do you remember the shirt? That's your mantra. The hook. It was the hook. The, well, the first time I ever did the accent without the dialect coaches, you know, mothering me was for a video game. And it was both terrifying and liberating when I realized it was like a, like a fool standing for the first time, like, I think I can actually do this. Oh, which video game? Oh, I don't know. Lord of the Rings, blah, 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 from the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 2004, Lord of the Rings. All of us PS2 players need to know if it was that video game. Elijah, how about you and Frodo's accent? The accents were really specifically mapped out as they were also articulating um, based on region, where, where characters came from, and there was a lot of thought put into it, none of it was accidental. And with Frodo, the thought process was that get, so the, the, not having him have a country accent due to being of a slightly more noble blood, being a... Um, a Baggins and his uncle kind of showing him a broader worldview and his accent being reflected with that broader world worldview. So RP is sort of standard, received pronunciation was the choice. Um, so that it was just very, very simple. Um, and that he sounded slightly other, um, which would again just evoke his relationship to Bilbo. So this is the time where I'm gonna tell everybody and the nice people who put the screens in backstage. Oh, they didn't, didn't like that one bit of sorry nice people backstage. backstage. That they're going to put up a QR code for the fan hub, and everyone in this room can ask us a question. This is so nice in case you're too afraid. This tech is so Seattle. <laughs> and I'm the person who is going to choose which questions to ask. My name is Ashley Victoria Robinson. Twice now in my life, and that was all very recently. Um, I, I am not an experienced magic player, so I would get my ass whipped. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. Uh, I know you're a staple at our magic cons, yes, so I, yeah. it would be it would be a shame not to ask about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. Casinos call me. They won't let me play anymore. They're like, he's, he's counting magic. He's counting cards. <laughs> Can't let him know. That's the rules. How many hit points do you think you get, dude? <laughs> Can't ask questions and fresh at the same time. Oh, good, there's only 93 so far. <laughs> Question number one. Will Elijah Wood and Christopher Lloyd do an impromptu over the garden wall panel? I don't know if we have the time for that, but I would certainly love to. I love, I love over the garden wall. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say probably not in this room. But maybe next year I'm going to see Comic Con. 
Who is the 10th anniversary of the of Wolf of the Garden Wall this year? This afternoon. And if anyone hasn't watched, you now have homework for the rest of the show. What was your favorite movie or scene? I'm going to say not from Lord of the Rings, from anything. Favorite movie or scene? I'm so sorry to do that to you. I urge you to watch Man on Fire. Yes. Denzel Washington's greatest performance in a career of great performances. Fantastic movie. Wonderful. Well, I mean, it's impossible. I don't. It's impossible, but what? What, I, what jumped into my head was uh, Peter O'Toole in, in, um, in Lawrence of Arabia when he's saying that the, uh, the tr it's not that it doesn't hurt, the trick is not minding so much. Yeah, I had a pinched nerve the other day, so that I took wisdom from that. <laughs> and he said, Lawrence of Arabia is what I need. <laughs> How about you, Elijah? Oh my god, it's like an impossible question. I know. <laughs> I could be here for hours talking about favorite scenes and favorite movies. Um, but you were talking just beforehand about a movie. Oh, yeah, a recent film. Um, the Zone of Interest. John Glazer's new film. Um, really powerful, upsetting film. Um, <laughs> Light Fair, uh, about the commandant of Auschwitz and his family. And the, the thing that makes it so extraordinary and uncomfortable is that it, it never goes beyond the walls of the family's home, but they share a wall with, with Auschwitz. And so you are sort of in this this reality of their reality in this home as if they're pretending as if these things aren't, these atrocities aren't occurring on the other side of the wall. But you hear them and it's, it's just deeply upsetting and beautifully filmed and, and an important film to see. Who was your favorite actor to share a scene with? You don't have to say someone on this couch. <laughs> favorite actor to share a scene with? You know, let's say Lord of the Rings since it's the theme of the battle. <laughs> Look, there was only one miserable old son of a bitch <laughs> on, on, on Lord of the Rings. The, the entire cast was not only gifted, talent, talented, perfectly cast, but they were the most amiable and congenial and delightful and, and op optimistic young actors and old actors that, that I've ever worked with. They were fantastic. It's just a pity about the old miserable son of a bitch. It's just not true. Un un unfortunately, true. unfortunately, I wore his boots every day. John, John's voice may communicate some of that rough thing, but you have so much joy and humor and like his boating. He likes to boat. John in a boat in the Cook Strait. Like, John. You can't, you can't go in the country straight in your little boat. boat. You're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> but he just has. Um, uh, there's a whimsy in you that is so poetic. I'm so I glad. You. I'm so glad you mentioned the boat. Yes, yes. Um, because I actually, I actually bought a cheap boat and had it renovated in New Zealand and took it all the way to England, where it promptly sank. <laughs> And as for being a fisherman, I should be in the Guinness Book of Records because when I draw a hook in the water, you can hear the fish laughing. <laughs> I watch on TikTok these people who are going to cross, you know, circumnavigate the globe and they've got their satellite phones and their GPS. John's just like with an oar. <laughs> That is very gimme aspect, just make it under your own power. <laughs> but the, the real fisherman, of course, was uh, Vigo. Vigo is, is a really, well, everything Vigo does is so accomplished. Everyone in the audience is like, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Has anybody attended their high school reunions? <laughs> Not I, no. I didn't, I didn't graduate high school. Oh. Oh. Sorry. And it hurt him. <laughs> I think I might have gone to one, but it's never really my vibe. You didn't want to go and show off? I, I, I got invited back and I gave a very bad speech and they never invited me again. So. <laughs> what is your favorite Lord of the Rings meme? Will you wear waves? Have you worn waves? 
this is where we have the others activity around social science. So I'm, I'm finishing up a degree in uh, public administration, public policy. And uh, yes, woo! Wow! Shout out to all you administrators out there. Well, well done. Well done. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the class that I'm just finishing right now, tomorrow, I have my last paper of this class, it's a human resource management, whatever, and they wanted us to do a meme for uh, something about retention or something like that, and I asked my daughter, I'm like, what kind of meme should I use? And I was thinking of like, the girl walking with the guy, like, you know the one, right? Yeah. yeah. She sends me Sean Bean like this, one does not simply retain employees. <laughs> Uh, for John, what is the name of the boat that sank? Gone. <laughs> Does it need to be more feminine, Gonley, or something? I, I actually call it Dwarf Cat. Actually, Dwarf Scat. Which, which, of course, refers to Scat as well. Yeah. And it really was. And it's uh, Anyway. And uh, never was there a greater proof that the ownership of a boat consists of taking out hundred dollar bills and pouring it into the ocean. <laughs> Tearing them up and putting it. Which cast member from The Lord of the Rings smells the best? Vigo. <laughs> Vigo <laughs> smells good. Billy <laughs> always smells like, like a bath. bath. True. What do you mean it smells like a bath? He, he bathes a lot, Billy. <laughs> bath. He loves the bath. If you tried to go out, you know, instead of saying, I don't want to go out with you, he's like, well, I'll have a bath. Yeah, yeah. bath is a sleeper. Yeah. He's, he's a real hot yeah. <laughs> He'll eat, and then, yeah. So, but he always got kind of a load to toilet vibe going on. <laughs> okay, this is a good follow up for that. Any plans to go and see Billy and Dom in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Really? In Toronto? It's in Toronto now, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, unfortunately, but like, there's a good chance that it will continue on. Say more. I, well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, my. Beyond, beyond uh, there being hope that it might. Yes. I mean, Would anyone in Seattle like for them to bring it here? We'll send that message along. So I don't know if this is appropriate to share, but Ali, my oldest, who I've been talking about all day now, uh, said... Four or five times in the last three days, I really want to go see Don and Billy and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And so I just had this idea that I would just sort of fly her there so she could do that. And uh, this is a story about fathers and daughters. So she comes in and I said, hey, Allie. And she was, I don't know, she was grumbling or focused on something. But she just kind of grumbled and moved back. So I was like, oh, you picked the wrong minute not to like, answer me. <laughs> Give me what you want, but, uh, so, so I, if she wants to go, I'm, I'm, I'm are people going to show this online? online? No. Don't show. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm telling you that I would be happy to send Allie to Toronto to see the boys <laughs> if she wants to go. <laughs> Allie, you're welcome. <laughs> and Allie's also in Lord of the Rings, correct? She is. For anyone who doesn't know, now you have more homework. Over there in the mall, find Allie at the end of Return of the King. Question for DJ Elijah. What's your favorite vinyl album to spin at home? Mm. Oh, man. No pressure. That's also really hard. That's a mean question, actually. <laughs> Whoever asked that, you're mean. I don't know. Uh, it's probably like, like an Alice Coltrane record, or um, oh yeah, that's that's let's do a lot of jazz, jazz at home. Um, yeah, Pabathini. <laughs> that was mean. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. There, there isn't like, like a go-to go record necessarily. Who is your favorite or least favorite Lord of the Rings character besides yourself? I don't, I don't think character actors. I leave you to interpret that. John has two to choose from. Well, Sam. <laughs> I guess I guess it has to be Aragorn because he is the one one of the central heroes. The problem I always have with Lord of the Rings is I think the characters are a little bit one dimensional. They're all rather special. I mean, you are Christ, essentially. <laughs> <Settle down. laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the, every, every one of them is a specialist in their own particular way, 
uh, and lives in their own little world or private world. And um, but I happen to think that actually Gimli is more human than the rest of them. <laughs> be be no, and I, hang on, let me explain why. Because they they don't really have any faults. Um, Gimli has got all of our faults, uh, and and yet all the characteristics that we that we would hope that we have, the, the good things, the good qualities that we have, the capacity for friendship, the capacity uh, for bravery and all that, which offsets the suspicion, the paranoia, the aggression. Um, and the one characteristic that he has that I don't think any of the others are written to have is that he has the capacity to change. And that, it makes him a very interesting character, I think. I, I mean, as you're talking about it, you know, we, we always think of the Shire, the idyllic, pastoral, you know, garden setting, beautiful setting, the, the home that's worth preserving, the good that's in the world that's worth preserving. But Gimli feels that for Moria, is just the same level of pride and enthusiasm and warmth and the food and the fellowship and the family in that place and to be able to to fill the space of that cavern with that kind of uh, joy is uh, I, th I think maybe you don't notice it's, you know, it's not so obvious that that's happening but it's, it's real and I, I yeah, which my new favorite character is Gimli <laughs> you, would, you would have made a great Gimli it's happening, I feel it now. <laughs> My kids would tell you that I'm more like Emily than Sam, for sure, for sure, for sure. I, that's why I don't let them out much, because... Yeah. Mm. Well, I like you, Emily. Well, I was going to say a favorite character of mine, I think, is Gollum. Um, he was from oh, yes, yes, of course. Yes. I love Colin, and I hate that guy. I come. I fell in love with the character from the Riddles in the Dark chapter from The Hobbit, um, and the complexity and the depth of the character as, as described in Lord of the Rings is just fascinating. The journey that that character is on, its history having been a Hobbit, being, being you know, tortured by the ring and, and transform, physically transformed, and as a slave to this thing, but yet with with the sort of interior of that character, there is there is hope that, that he can come back from the brink. And I love that. I love the kind of complexity of, of that character. It's made me think of you've got we've got him tied up with the elven rope which burns his skin. And as far as I'm concerned, I just want to kill him. And like he's just, we're just done with this guy. He's done. It's not so sneakily, you know. I know. Well, and you and you, Elijah, and you, Frodo are seeing something in him. And so Sam has to like honor Frodo to try and see what he sees, but honor himself to know that he's dangerous. Yeah. And like, I feel like that, that is a dilemma that we all are facing on this planet right this second at home and abroad is trying to look at other people and see where there's a threat and where there's humanity and, and figure out how to navigate it. And so, yeah. Yes. Probably my favorite question so far, so shout out to Coulter who asked this. Sean, what Starbucks drink are you enjoying? <laughs> I'm going to go with a venti Americano on that one. Oh. Well, my wife, Christine, will be watching this online, so it's uh, herbal tea. <laughs> oh. Nobody tell me. Herbal tea. Yeah. This is between us and the earth. Look, I have a shameful thing to confess. I'm, I'm not a solitary drinker at all. But I was, I was in, uh, looking at my cupboard the other day, and all those bottles that people have given me over the years, you know, 
brandy and whiskey and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, the first thing that's going to happen when I die is this place is going to be looted and they'll be carrying off the drink. <laughs> and, and I thought, why don't I have a little experiment there? So I, I make my liter cup of coffee oh first thing Woo! in the morning. And, and I add a bit of honey to it. And I add just a little tincture of rum. <laughs> Oh my God, you've heard it, John. You've heard it. And I tell you, it's a damn sight better than Starbucks. <laughs> that sounds delicious. For John, where was there, in fact, was there an actor or actress who particularly inspired you over the course of your incredible career? I got into Rana by Koff. <laughs> Jealousy is such an ugly thing. <laughs> I got into Rada by actually copying one of the great English stage performers called Sir Michael Redgrave. I see the show that he did uh, in, in, at Chichester, he was doing Uncle Vanya. And I had a good Shakespeare, uh, but I thought, now I'm going to audition. I want to give them something that they've never heard before. So I took the end of that, I think the second act of Vanya, where the professor announces he's going to sell the whole estate, and Vanya actually loses his top and, uh, uh, and, uh, and ends up saying, You ruined my life! I've not lived! I'm, it hadn't been for you, I, I, I could have been a, a Schopenhauer or something like that. It's wonderfully, tragically funny. But they're all single lines, so I just rewrote it as uh, a monologue. And they obviously never heard it before, uh, and that always attracts people's interest. By and large, if you're an actor, do something that they haven't heard before. And if you haven't found it, then make it. Yeah. Uh, so I did a movie called Toy Soldiers. Yeah. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it's very well known. Deep cut. Uh, <laughs> um, but I had watched, I think this is right, my, you know, insert order of operations, but um, Untouchables. I had seen the Untouchables, and then I saw Dances with Wolves, and there was something about the way Kevin Costner was uh, uh, subtle, and, and he would kind of, there would be these shots, it was the same shot in every movie, you know, just, you know, now, cut to that, you can be looking at the prairie, you can be looking at Al Capone, you can be looking at whatever, it doesn't matter, it's the same, but there's something that he was like, would let, he, he was alive, I don't know, I, don't, I think I was at a certain age and I just kind of noticed that about him and the way that he was carrying these movies, and I just kind of thought, wow, how does he just keep making movie after movie after movie, and um, so I don't know that I was, that he was, uh, I just, yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> what was the origin question? <laughs> I, I'm lost. I'm just listening to these really great answers. <laughs> the origin question was which actor or actress has inspired you? Right. I mean, if you want to do not inspired, you can do that too. But I that's what really I'm going to ask you. There isn't, I must say, there isn't a single person that has had a single impact. I've been so inspired by so many people and, and so many people on the job. Right? Because my, my education, I started when I was seven, eight, so my education was working, you know, my, my classroom, my, my acting class was on the field, and, and that, just that experience and seeing others, not only others act and, and perform and, and bring a character to life in a very real way, which was inspiring, but also the practicality of that. How, how to be on set, how to treat other people the right way and the wrong way. Like, I had this really extraordinary education from a young age and, and was able to work with 
an incredible group of actors and directors and many different kinds of films prior to Lord of the Rings that was just an incredible education. So I'm, in, I'm indebted to all of those actors and, and all of those filmmakers and those environments for rearing me, you know, quite literally. Oh, no, can I build on that? Please, so Eric Stoltz, uh, we, we were in a movie together called Memphis Bell. Uh, Eric Stoltz. Eric Stoltz, very underappreciated actor. He's amazing. He's just incredible. So much heart, so much specificity in his work, so much um, discipline. And, and we, we got him for a day on Wilfred. He came into this a guest spot on Wilfred. It was, it was great. It was amazing. Yeah, sure. He directed, he directed I know, yeah. So we had lunch together. After we were back in America, you know, six months after shooting or whatever, and I remember asking him with a kind of just awe and curiosity and and just a state of like I just didn't understand. I said, "How is it that you you're always doing something that's so so interesting and so so creative and so like you wouldn't it's unexpected and." And he, he thought about it and he said, well, I just, you know, I look at what's in front of me and I decide which, what I want to do. And it was so um, arresting. But then I think about Elijah Wood, who, you know, I was the Goonies, right? Thank you very much. So, uh, but but my, my acting career as a child was, you know, I did something when I was eight for two weeks. I did something when I was 10 for four months. I did the Goonies for four months when I was 12, 13. And then I did something when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15. I didn't work consistently. But, and my parents were famous actors uh, with incredible success. My mom won Academy Award and four Emmys, and my father, you know, very successful. And they were happy to kind of like, let me, let me do this thing. But they weren't, they weren't managing me. They weren't managing my career. It just seemed to, you know, opportunities kind of would happen or whatever. And then you look at Elijah Wood as an eight-year-old kid, and then nine and 10 and 11, 12, 14, 15, and he's always doing, he, you, are always doing something extraordinary. Something with really important actors with stories that are really good. And I just remember thinking like, how does he know? How does he know how to do that? Like, is his mom like this Spengali genius? Is he like, you know, and, and, uh, and, and you know, just admiring your... Absolutely, when I found out that you were playing Frodo, it was more, more than Serene McKellen, more than anybody else that I knew that was going to be... In the, until I found out John was in the movie. And then I'm like, <laughs> but but, but I, I just thought, like, I'm going to have an opportunity to work with somebody who's... Work and career I've admired my whole life, and he's 10 years younger than me, and I'm young. That was weird. That's crazy. Thank you. Friends, we're pretty close to the end of the panel. I know it's very sad, but please don't run out, because we're all going to take a selfie together before we leave. So I want to end on this last question, because Chris Evans was on this stage right before everybody here, and everybody in the audience asked this question. He said he wants to work on a Lord of the Rings property. Would you welcome Captain America into the Lord of the Rings family? Yes or no? Chris Evans is awesome. Yeah, I am the gatekeeper, by the way, and so I bless the concept here. Uh, I love Chris Evans. I love all the choices that he makes as an actor, and uh, beyond all the Marvel stuff. But, um, yeah, and listen, apparently there's going to be more stories told in Middle Earth. So, I wonder how this has to be. What those will be, we have no idea, but they're, they're, they are, there are plans to make more movies. You just welcomed in a thousand questions of will you be returning to the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's an opportunity for that, but. But you, you look at his success and, and how the industry sees him, and yet he's got the wonder. He's protected the kind of childlike imagination, wonder that he experienced when he watched these movies when he was probably pretty young. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right? And, uh, and, that, and that's what he, he has that aspiration to do something that has that kind of literary heft and stuff. So, you know, good for him. Good for him. All right, friends. Smoosh as close to your neighbors as close to the center as possible. We're going to take this selfie together.
All right, to help you all out, on the count of three, you're going to throw your hands in the air, you're going to scream, you're going to go crazy, and we're all going to look great in this photo. So get ready, we've got to count down for you here in just a second. Some people are sticking. All right, here we go. Hands in the air, let's scream on three, three, two, one, go! Yeah! 